That is Paul Messier. He's making a speech and presentation at the Library of Congress. Mr. Messier is an important part of our story. As a young photography conservator, he cracked the Lewis Hine case. Beyond just the image, the object has has this has this cultural value, and that's that's where you know things kind of ran off the rails, I guess, a little bit with the Lewis Hine thing. Was you know did the were these objects were these prints? They were you know the the market wasn't paying a lot of money for Lewis Hine images. They were paying a lot of money. <laughs> the, the payments were not for images. They were for objects. They were for things, and those things. That he touched, that he might have yeah, touched. Yeah, exactly. Purportedly were made by Lewis Hine. And, and that was, that's, there's, there's, a, there's market value there, but there's a lot of cultural value there. And that's where, you know, I think that there's a, you know, there's a higher plane to, to these kind of questions. It's not just, you know, the sort of salacious aspects of, of the, of the case, you know, but there's a there's a greater principle here of are you know are these objects authentic representations of something that Lewis Hine, that Lewis Hine or any other artist, you know, if we're talking more broadly, would have made? Is the connection that we have when we look at them in a museum collection on the wall is the connection that's being made between the viewer and the artist? Is that real? Is that reliable? And that's that's pretty fundamental. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've already ste stepped your toe into uh, the waters, <laughs> so let's jump in. Uh, yeah, let's jump in. Yeah, and, and you mentioned earlier a little bit about the uh, the Hine investigation. And yeah. uh, what I want to ask you about is, uh, so Dr. Mattis, Dr. Hochberg, they mm -hmm. contacted you and said, mm -hmm. uh, "Look at these. Tell us what you can see." Yeah, basically, so it was, um, you know, Michael Mattis, and he was at that time working together quite a bit with Andy Smith. I don't know if that's a name that you've come across, but Andy Andy is a dealer in uh, uh, New Mexico. And, uh, yeah, so Michael, principally it was Michael, but Andy was right there, put together. I, you know, I, basically I said to them, you know, I, if I looked at one, okay, that maybe I come up with something, but I really, I, I really need a group because I, I want to see if there are any sort of patterns that repeat across the group because that, that would carry a lot more weight. So they put together, oh, I don't even know. I mean, you've probably seen the report if you've got the FBI file. So they put together that group. I think maybe it was 8 to 15. I don't even quite remember. I have to look at it. But, um, yeah, so that initial group was the, was the group that, very rapidly came together through Michael and Andy Smith. So they just FedEx the photographs to you? Yep, and yep, just can't, yep, and that was ordinary, it still is ordinary most of the time. Yep, everything comes via FedEx. <laughs> <laughs> that's, well, it has to, it definitely has to. I mean, that's, yep, that's just the way the world works, yep. Okay, and, and, uh, Reading the FBI file, uh, the the I know this sounds strange, but the immediate thought that came to my mind was, you must have Batman's cave there because you've got a bat chromatograph, a bat spectrograph, a bat multi-analyzer, and all the techniques. <laughs> How did you de develop all these techniques? Well, I mean, it was pretty simple at the very beginning. Cause, and this is all kind of incorporated in your art conservation training, is, is kind of knowing what techniques are out there and knowing when to apply them and, and all of that. And so I didn't have a lot of gear, um, nor did I have a lot of expertise in the different analytical techniques, but I had a generalist understanding of what tools I needed and what expertise I needed. And so, you know, I just kind of built around that. Had you already started your paper stock collection, or no, or, or, no, and, I, and actually that was that that came directly out of the work on the Lewis Hine material. So I didn't even have I didn't have a reference collection then. I didn't have a reference baseline, and I immediately understood that such a baseline was was a was a critical need for the field. And you know, I just started building that gradually.
probably the main question I was asked to look into was what happened to the case? Why didn't yeah. they prosecute uh, Walter Rosenblum for, for forgery or fraud? And yeah. what I think I believe at this point is that your scientific approach, that culmination of all your observations, was such a large meteor of evidence that landed smack on uh, Mr. Rosenblum, he realized that he had to settle. He had to uh, avoid trial at all costs, and he did that by settling with the uh, alleged victims. Right. Now, right. does that make sense? Well, yes and no. I mean, I've not seen the FBI file, and so I don't know what they were thinking. I'd love to see it at some point. <laughs> but, you know, when it comes to the, to the physical evidence, I mean, there, was, there really was no... There was really no ambiguity about that. There See, was no argument and about this, And this is that. where I want to interrupt you because as yeah. a, a lawyer in a previous existence, I can tell you this. If I had seen that on behalf of my client, the defendant, I would yeah. have said, we have to plead, you're guilty. Yeah. Uh, and, right. and, and so right. let's let's do that. As, as far as the, the reason the FBI didn't continue prosecution, based on my experience as an attorney, uh, they love to let private parties settle the differences and if they can stay out of it they will again rosenblum also was a war hero taking the photographs there at, at on d-day yeah. and uh, a, a respected professor i can see where they can decide you know hey uh, no harm no foul the parties are satisfied and the other parties unlike dr mattis and dr hochberg they were so satisfied they agreed to uh yeah covenant not to say anything about what happened. Okay, Paul? Yep, I'm in. All set. Fantastic. Uh, one thing that I wanted to note, first off, is that at least one of the photographs that, that was asked by uh, Dr. Mattis and Dr. Hochberg to be uh, evaluated by you had purported signature from Lewis Hine on the paper, and the paper was actually established by you to have been manufactured after the photographer's death. Yeah. Have you been able to go through the FBI file that I emailed to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I looked at it for sure, but you know, I, I didn't go through it in great detail because just like you said, I had written most of that stuff. So, <laughs> so it was like, you know, it was like revisiting a, a, a chapter in my life. But yes, but I, yeah, I, I, I looked at it and I'm generally familiar with pretty much everything that's in that file. But it was great that you sent it, by the way, because now I know what was in it. You know, that's cool. I didn't know that before. Yeah. And you know, it was extremely cool to get it in the first place because sometimes I don't get what I ask the FBI to give me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I can imagine. But anyways, uh, when I mentioned earlier that I thought your investigation fell like a meteor upon the Rosenblums, I think that all of it was uh, intrinsic to that belief that I have. But the fact that there's a signature on paper that could not have existed at the time of his life is like the biggest part of that meteor. Is that how you would see it? Well, yeah, I mean, I, and I don't know all of the, the nuances of how those prints were presented to buyers, but I think all you have to do is ask um, Michael Mattis or Andy Smith or, or, or any of the people that, that bought them. I mean, they thought they were buying genuine prints. And so when you have, you know, new paper and an artist's signature, it does imply strongly, I think, that there was an intention to deceive by making those prints and putting them on the market. Right. Another question I have for you, uh, Paul, is has the detection of forgeries in the photography world developed, uh, cough, cough, since the time, <laughs> since the time of the hind forgeries? Yeah, I mean, quite a bit, quite a bit. I mean, I think the first thing is a consciousness that the photography market isn't immune to fakes and frauds. So I think that was a major step. This was among the first big authenticity scandals. There was a Man Ray scandal that was happening almost concurrently with this one. And there have been some others, but this was kind of a, a, a shot over the bow for um, curators, collectors, dealers. 
that these kind of practices, you know, the, the, the creation of, of frauds, it wasn't just for the paintings market, or it wasn't just for the, for the uh, prints and drawings. I mean, it, was, it could happen in the photography market, too. So that was a major step. I think the second, uh, another major step was um, conservators, you know, people like me, started thinking more and more about basic characterization of photographic prints. How do you create and structure data around the life's work of a photographer? For particular photographers, what's their approach to the medium, the physical aspects of the medium, papers in particular? And that's where the, um, the paper collection comes in, you know, that, that collection that I put together over 20 or so years, and it's now, yeah, I mean, that, that really is a, a new development that came straight out of the scandal, and it's a, it's a scholarly resource now. It's a, it serves to preserve the, the physical history of the medium, the material history of photography, but it also serves as a reference point, a baseline, to make those kind of distinctions that you that you were talking about like well how can you prove that this paper was made in the 80s versus the 1920s well i mean one of the ways is you can you can go into the paper collection and you can get several hundred examples of papers made in the 1920s versus the 1980s and you can see how they're physically different right chemically and chemically different right so that's a, you know, I think that's a very major kind of innovation. And yeah, and we're always, you know, there's always a spy versus spy component to all of this. You know, as you get better tools, sometimes the techniques, the, the forgery techniques become more refined and all of that. So there's, we haven't eradicated the potential for, for fake forgeries, that's for sure. But yeah, I mean, we've got a lot more tools now than we had maybe 20 years ago. Let me move on to another question, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and that's, uh, are you still available to evaluate or authenticate photographs? Yeah, I'm definitely available to consult on, you know, authenticity investigations. You know, I, like I said last week, I, I don't really fancy myself or, or, or I don't really characterize my work as authentication as much as it is kind of the material analysis that goes into um, a larger uh, uh, authentication study. I think provenance is a huge component, um, and that kind of research is kind of, you know, is beyond my scope. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. If, if people have questions about where a print falls in terms of the material history of 20th century photography, I've got, I definitely have tools to do that. It's not so much in my capacity as a, as a researcher and lab head at Yale. So this, these would typically private consultations and certainly the people who are working in my studio now today you know they have these capabilities as well and sometimes i don't don't even necessarily have to be involved right what would you suggest that a vintage photograph collector have in his or her toolkit to detect obvious forgeries that's a good question i think the first thing is a is a network of experts Knowing who to ask is really the key. Knowing, you know, experts, if you're thinking of collecting an Edward Weston, for example, who out there knows more about Edward Weston than anybody else and, and have that person in your network. I think that's, that, the, the network of expertise, I think, is the most powerful tool that any collector can have. When it comes to sort of, you know, physical tools, you know, for a long time now, people have been going into auction houses and galleries and all that with a, with a black light, with a UV source, looking for optical brighteners. Um, I, I've got some questions about that because it sometimes can be very difficult to determine whether something has optical brighteners or not. So there's an interpretation piece that, if you don't have training or experience, can be kind of difficult to master. The other component of, of that is, well, you know, it's not optical brighteners, yes or no, it's, it's, it's only one part of the equation. And there were papers that were made after the, the late 1950s when optical brighteners were introduced. There were papers, you know, a significant minority of papers made after that point that don't incorporate optical brighteners at all. So I think, you know, in terms of the toolkit, a UVA source can be helpful if used correctly and used safely. You should definitely wear eye protection 
to filter out the UV so it's not just streaming into your eyes, especially as it would in a dark room. I think you can get some information there as a collector, but I really feel strongly that thinking critically and having, don't go it alone kind of idea. You know, think critically. If it looks too good to be true, it, it may in fact be too good to be true. Know what questions to ask and know who to ask those questions to. Build those ties, build those networks of experts. Now, I have to admit, it makes a lot of sense. And I have to also admit that it was surprising to me, which it shouldn't have been because it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you know, so well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, very, it's a very nuanced field, you know, I mean, it's, there's a lot that goes into it. And um, I don't think anybody should and can claim ultimate expertise. Like, I am the ultimate expert in XYZ. Uh, if you if you start hearing that kind of stuff, I mean that that's sort of a, a, a red flag that maybe it's a little bit of snake oil. Because <laughs> we're, I mean we're learning so much every single day, every day. You know, I work with the collection, I learn something new. Yeah. And so that's just that's just an illustration <laughs> of you know even though maybe. <laughs> Maybe, you know, 20th century photography is a closed set at this point. There's still so much to learn. Yeah. I mean, that just reminded me of somebody who would come from another lawyer because they were uh, unhappy with their services, and, the, and they would say that that lawyer said that they were the world's foremost and, or whatever. And you're right. That is kind of a hint that maybe you're not getting exactly what your lawyer's projecting. <laughs> yeah, so that, that critical thinking piece is the, is the key. What stops somebody from buying up old stock paper and creating supposedly lifetime photographs? Yeah, well, of course, that's a technique from other forgeries, right? I mean, that works on paper in particular. I mean, that's the textbook step number one is to acquire old paper. In photography, it, it kind of works the same way, but there are some significant caveats. So photography, photographic paper, you know, obviously it's manufactured to be light sensitive. And that light sensitivity changes significantly over time, interaction with the environment. So let's say you knew that, um, oh, I don't know, you know, uh, Edward Weston was using a certain paper um, in the 1940s, and you were able to find that paper, that exact paper, on eBay in an unopened package. And if, you know, somehow if you got the negative or a negative or something, you, you were able to come up with some kind of a negative that you could print and make it credible. Well, it's good luck. I mean, good luck. I mean, it's that, that paper is going to behave unpredictably. The image that you render is probably not going to look anything like another Edward Weston out there, even, even if it's on the same paper. There would be deterioration characteristics, fogging perhaps. It's just, it's just not going to behave predictably. There was a study some time ago at the, um, at that time it was the George Eastman House, by some research fellows there, and they were able to make some fairly successful prints out of older papers. But I don't think any of their results would have passed on the market with people who are aware of, of the artist's work over a lifetime. If it's Edward Weston, for example, mm -hmm. there's deep expertise in the way Edward Weston is supposed to look. You get back to your network of experts. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's I think it's a it's a challenge. I don't know if you know the Crespi Le Prince scandal. Uh, that, that was something that uh, is going on. Well, it's, it's, it's resolving now in the French courts, but that was an instance of photographs purporting to be from the 1840s, so very early photographs, um, 1840s, 1850s, I think, that were supposedly discovered in, in France and Normandy. They were attributed to this artist, Crespi Le Pais, who was noted as a painter and a lithographer, and all of those were made on old paper. And that was one of the more challenging aspects of researching those because the paper pretty much added up in terms of the date. So in the 19th century, it's different. You know, you don't have these industrially applied emulsion right, uh, right. Uh, surfaces. So you're kind of doing darkroom chemistry 
you know, in your kitchen sink, you could do it potentially, right? And for 20th century material, it becomes a little more, becomes a much higher bar technically. Huh. Of course, I went on eBay to look up old stock paper. Couldn't find much. In fact, the, the only thing I found was, and this might have been just a timing or coincidence issue, but the only thing that I found was a, a kid's photographic kit. Yeah. It was from like the 40s, yeah. and, and I looked through the, the listing, and it had, I even uh, was able to enlarge the photographic paper, and it said commercial paper on it, mm -hmm. so it looked like you could get commercial paper. It was yeah. probably crap, but at least there was something out there that would have, you know, if I were a criminal and I wanted to make sure that it would, it would date back to that time, there was something there. Not good, but it was there. Yeah. Yeah, just as a side note, there are artists out there, um, Alison Rossiter is a name that comes to mind, who as part of their art, as part of their photography, they will buy old papers and they will repurpose those old papers to make images. And for Alison Rossiter's work anyway, part of that encounter is this sort of surprise, you know, is the sort of, you know, she integrates the, the aging of the papers and the unpredictability of their response into her work. It's kind of cool. You might, you might enjoy checking it out. Well, I will. Uh, yeah. the, the, the other thing that I saw on eBay, and I hate to go back to eBay, but I'm back there now with you. And we're, yeah. we're looking on eBay. We're looking uh -huh. at daguerreotypes, and uh -huh. there's eight for $40.99. Yeah. What, what, Paul, what takes, what keeps somebody from buying the eight for $40.99 with all these schlocky photographs of yeah. old timey folks, uh, chemically or mechanically removing the photograph and then using the old plate in the frame or case or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. So is that something that you have yeah, to worry about? Yeah, it's, yeah, no, it's, that's all practical. Um, that's all possible. You know, a daguerreotype image is, it's an incredibly delicate surface, and the idea of maybe buffing out that image and then repurposing that plate, I mean, it's, it's, it's not only is it possible, people have done it. I've not seen that, knock on wood, I've not seen that as a, as a technique to deceive. I, I wouldn't say it's not out there, daguerreotypes are not my particular area of expertise. But, you know, again, there's a, there is this degree of difficulty um, aspect of working with older materials. They, they don't behave all that predictably. And so I would imagine that there are some real technical challenges to, to doing that work. But in theory, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a perfectly plausible scenario. Right. I also wanted to mention, from having watched one of your uh, videos, about the digital fingerprints. These digital fingerprints seem to me to be microscopic images of the patterns that the paper fibers make. And, you know, I looked at them and, and, and it sure does seem like they, that each paper is a lot different. And, and uh, I know you have categories of rough and, uh, sure. and, and so on, but can you tell us about that a little bit? Well, yeah. I mean, if you think about just any piece of paper, it doesn't have to be a photograph. If you put it under the microscope, there's a network of fibers. And that network of fibers, if, if, you just, if you're looking at one spot, and you're looking at that one spot consistently across multiple, multiple papers, let's say you're, you know, you're thinking about prints made by a certain artist, right? And, and each... Each paper from a macro level will be the same. You, you won't see any difference. You won't see any texture difference. But if you look at a single area on those papers under the microscope, that fiber network will be distinct. It will be absolutely unique. And if you can document that in a consistent sort of repeatable way, you've now, yeah, you've now got a fingerprint for that object. 